Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Okay, welcome back to Roadcase, everybody. This is your host, Josh Rosenberg, and thanks for joining me for this special episode where we will focus on mental health issues and services for touring professionals, and we'll learn more about that in a few minutes. Um, As I start out every episode, I want to encourage the listeners um, and primarily thank uh, listeners for supporting Roadcase. And if you haven't done so, I'd like to encourage you to get involved with the Roadcase community um, and you can support uh, Roadcase in a number of different ways. Uh, Primarily, you can go to Patreon where there is a system that's set up to help support financially Roadcase. Uh, You can think of it as Uh, subscription and for uh, the price of a cup of coffee a month you can help me continue to bring these great episodes uh, to listeners and uh, show support for Roadcase that way and you can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash roadcase pod. Um, of course, if you can't swing that, totally understandable. There are other ways that you can get involved, one of which is to rate and review this podcast on uh, the platform that you're listening to. And you can find this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And while you're there, uh, if you do rate or say a couple good words about Roadcase, um, that goes a long way as well, and that is free of charge to do so. Uh, you can also follow Roadcase on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and get involved that way, or you can also get involved by shooting me an email at info at roadcasepod.com. Uh, also, our handle on socials is at roadcasepod, and we also have a YouTube channel, Roadcase Podcast. For this episode of Roadcase, I'm really excited to introduce Hillary Gleason to Roadcase. She is the executive director of Backline, also known as Backline Cares. Backline is a nonprofit mental health organization that provides mental health and wellness resources to music industry professionals. And by that, I mean that You can find a therapist and wellness resources through Backline by calling a phone number that Backline uh, can provide to you. And it's basically a centralized resources, a centralized resource for those in the music industry to begin that mental health journey. It's very difficult to be on the road and you don't just leave your problems behind. And Hillary brings her a global health background, a background in nonprofits in New York, working for an organization called Global Citizen. Uh, She also has a consulting firm called Level Consulting, where she connects businesses and bands. So uh, we'll hear a lot about how she came into this business and what Backline can provide to those that are touring professionals who just need to talk to somebody and need uh, someone to listen and um, help with their problems. And Hillary has done so much work in the nonprofit arena, and I really applaud her for that. She's done some amazing, amazing things, and she was really spurred by her love of music. Um, she's many of the nonprofit organizations that she's been involved with focus on the music industry and its connection to businesses at large and how those two entities can come together. Of course, Backline being a nonprofit organization depends on the generous support of those in the industry, of performers, of bands, and of others that love the live music industry for them to continue to provide the services that help to um, bring mental health services to those that are in need. Uh, To date, Backline has mostly been supported by the music industry itself. There's been a number of different initiatives, such as uh, a 
ticket fees or a portion of merch or venues kicking in a couple dollars. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but really importantly, there will be an online stream to benefit backline. And that's coming up on April 10th. It will be on the relics channel on Twitch. So I hope that everyone gets involved with that and donates generously to backline. So tune into that and you can find out about all the cool musical guests that they are going to have. And you can learn more about that on the backline social so I want to thank Hillary again for all the amazing work that she does and I want to thank her for being here for this special episode of Road Case and thanks to all of you for tuning in and giving a listen to this special episode and here we go okay cool Hillary how are you doing Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me on Roadcase today. I am doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be chatting with you. Yeah, I'm psyched too. Um, so I understand you're joining me from the great northwest of Portlandia. Yep. Um, great place to be right now while everything is calm and spend a bunch of time in nature. Um, yeah. But I'm also looking forward to not being in Portland full time at some point in the next year and getting back on the road myself. Yeah. So, so you're basically, uh, you'll go on tour as part of, um, in, in, of what you do. Uh, not necessarily, although I like to think that I set up my own tours. Um, (laughs) I backline doesn't have any official touring capacity, but I do travel a lot, um, both for my work with backline as well as, the consulting work that I do um, and just to see great shows and link up with friends when they are playing at iconic venues around the oh, country. Yeah, that sounds so like a good plan. <laughs> I end up traveling <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so why don't you explain just kind of a little bit about what, uh, what backline does sort of big picture and then we'll, we'll um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get down into it a little bit more. Great. Um, so Backline works to provide mental health and wellness resources to music industry professionals. So we built it in October 2019 in order to give people a safe, private place to go when they were having mental health struggles or wanted to find access to therapists or wellness resources. Um, and so it is a centralized resource for anyone in the music industry to begin that journey. So was there one episode in particular that kind of lit a spark inside and that, that said like, Oh, this definitely needs to happen right now. Two, um, in the summer of 2019, there were two suicides in the music community and in my direct music community, that is, um, one being that of Jeff Austin of Yonder Mountain String Band, um, and then Neil Casal, a prolific guitarist from Northern California, um, Circles Around the Sun and other Mm -hmm. amazing contributions, um, and we lost them in a period of about two months. So, wow, that was, uh, I know that was a really devastating loss. So how did that change, um, the way that you looked at the world and your opportunity there? That created a, a rallying cry in our community that we needed to figure out how we could better support one another and create a private confidential, clinically sound support system. Um, And so we started a series of conference calls with people from across the music industry um, to really talk about what resources were out there, what their personal journeys had looked like, how they found help for themselves or their bandmates when they needed it, um, and identified that there was just really a missing link in between the mental health care space and the music industry. And so we built Backline to serve as that missing link and to really have an understanding of what other nonprofits serve this community with mental health and wellness resources, um, to understand the eligibility requirements for things like music cares that are so important in this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for people to be able to come to us and say, I'm not sure what I'm eligible for, or I'm having a hard time finding out how to sign up for health insurance. Um, And we can then direct them out to these organizations and care providers around the country. 
So you operate as kind of a, it's sort of like a, a, a middle station, way station to uh, direct those to the getting the resources that they might need. So uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And we have, mm -hmm, and we have now built out a national network of mental health providers around the country who have experience working with the music community. Um, so mm. when somebody comes to us and is saying, looking for a therapist, we can actually refer them out to someone who has experience working with this community so that the questions that they're being asked in those sessions are reflective of the, the experience of a music industry professional, which you know, is unlike any other job in the world. So right. it's really important to have that understanding going into the session. And we're seeing much better relationships built between those therapists in our network and the, the music industry professionals that are using them. Yeah, interesting. So <clears throat> Hillary, what do you bring to the table? Like, what's your background? And how did you how did you come to to this, uh, to want to do this type of work? I have a global health background, mm -hmm. um, started when I was 17 years old, um, at the time thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon. So I was interning <laughs> wow. for a neurosurgeon at Duke hospital where I grew up. Um, and he asked for my support on figuring out how we could increase neurosurgical capacity in Uganda. Um, so at the time there were only three neurosurgeons in the country. Um, there were 25 at Duke for reference. Um, and so he said, how can we change this? And he and I built out this program where we would buy back used medical equipment from Duke and ship it to Uganda and then go with a full team of surgeons and nurses and anesthesiologists and, um, do training camps around that. And so I, I went to Uganda the year before I went to college and realized I wanted to be in global health and, didn't need to be a surgeon to do that. There needed to be someone like me there who operated as essentially the tour manager of the trip, making sure that everyone right. gets on the bus at the end of the day and it has lunch show up and all of those things. So I went to college to study um, global health and Africana studies and really looking at the systems behind access to healthcare. Um, and that has always been my passion. So I went on to work at some nonprofits um, in Washington, D.C. and New York, where most of the international health nonprofits are. Mm -hmm. um, landed at Global Citizen when I was in New York, which um, does a ton of great advocacy work around um, health and sanitation and um, vaccines and all of these other indicators of poverty. Um, that was such an interesting role to land in because I was using my nonprofit experience, but they also have a 60,000 person music festival in Central Park every year. Right. Um, that happens during the UN General Assembly. So there's tons of world leaders involved and really pairing up pop stars with world leaders making commitments around, you know, health and safety of our world's most vulnerable. Um, and there's certainly power in connecting musicians and these voices with causes um, and the way in which that connects with fans. So that was a pivotal experience in my life. And also while I was working at Global Citizen, I found myself in Peter Shapiro's venues in New York in my free time, um, enjoying shows at the Brooklyn Bowl and Capitol Theater. And, yeah. um, falling into that community. So when I left, I went on to start a consulting firm that connects businesses and bands with impactful nonprofits, really trying to dive into how bands are able to connect with the causes that they care about, what organizations they're supporting, what that messaging looks like for fans, and mm -hmm. making sure that that is really rock solid and that everyone involved feels like they are a part of an important change. Um, so I have been doing that now for three and a half years, and that's what I bring to the table is wow. um, the belief that everyone should have access to health care um, and that everyone should have access to music. And I think that the way that the two are overlapping now in its current capacity is um, a really beautiful thing. And, and I have gotten so much from music in my life being a lifelong music fan. Um, my dad 
took me to see a lot of shows when I was super, super young. And yeah, it has certainly been the soundtrack of my life. Um, so it is a really beautiful thing to have the two come together in something that is so meaningful. Um, so Backline is truly a passion project and not just that of my own experience and passions, but also that of several other co-founders that have come all in on this journey with me and been super integral, bringing each of their unique experiences to the table to make it much bigger and faster moving than I could have done on my own. Wow, that's amazing. So this prior uh, project was called Global Citizen, or is that the name of the con- that's the name of the concert that occurs, or it's that's all kind of the that's name all kind of the of- concert and the nonprofit. Yeah. Interesting. So how far did that go along in terms of getting bands involved in supporting different causes? So Global Citizen is still active today. They are doing a ton of work um, every every time I turn around, they are announcing something else. Um, so I believe they started in something like 2008 and continue Mm -hmm. to have that festival every year, um, and are doing a ton of great work. And then, uh, my consulting firm also continues to, to do work. We have a couple clients, including Rex foundation and sweet relief musicians fund. And I've hired a great team there to, um, pick up my slack as I am really, trying to be focused on the backline space right now as much as I can be because our need for services has certainly grown quite a bit over the past year. Right. So back in 2019, um, with the um, unfortunate passing of Jeff Austin and Neil Casal was sort of that, that bridge that gave you kind of that push in the direction of more along the mental health lines uh, for touring professionals, right? During that time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, based on my own personal experience and that of the other co-founders and, you know, where had we gone when someone in our community needed help? Um, Yeah. And the answer was not very straightforward. You know, you would have to call someone else that you knew who had seen a therapist and said, Hey, right. you just have to do it like like regular people do. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Which is extremely hard to prioritize when you're, you know, in a tour bus with 12 other people going 85 miles an hour down the highway. Um, right. Literally and figuratively. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, it's, it's very much based in the reality of the experience. Um, and, we launched six weeks after our initial conference calls because we saw the need was so pronounced in our community. Um, and we both wanted to create a place for people to go who were grieving and really needing those services, but also a place for all of the people on the conference call who wanted to throw their support and channel their pain into something positive, a way to do that. And that's interesting. I mean, I mean, I, I so applaud your work and you have the, an amazing background and I can just I can tell that you can bring people together. And obviously you have <laughs> um, how how do you um, what's your primary way of getting the word out that there are services that are, are available for music professionals? We have been entirely grassroots up until this point, um, so when we launched, it was really around a touring industry and we did things like getting signage up in green rooms around the country. I think we were in about a hundred backstage spaces so that everyone who was coming through those spaces had the opportunity to see what we did. We created laminates that people could have on their laminate clip, which, you know, for those of us who have toured, you know how many laminates you have on your laminate clip and then that gives you access to, you know, all the places that you need to be. And so instead of having a business card, creating a laminate clip so you could take it off of yours and give it to someone else who might need that. Um, We do a lot of work around social media. Um, We do a lot of getting people to email their entire management roster or their entire label and say, hey, here's a new resource that exists for you if you ever need something like this. Um, And so we have been entirely word of mouth, grassroots approach and really wanting to make sure that the clinical elements of the work that we're doing work um, before we blast it out too far and that we have enough case managers 
to meet the need and, and be able to answer the phone when people say that they need to get on the, a call with someone. And so now that we have reached that point and we know that clinically this works, you know, we're 17 months in at this point, um, mm-hmm. we have started to receive some more uh, large scale support from partners like Sony um, and really they are coming on to support us and making sure that we are reaching into every community within the music industry with this message that, Hey, these resources exist for you. And, and that is a really fun new element of what we're doing right now is just scaling up to make sure that people in every genre and in every office have heard about this and know that it's something that they can use if, and when they need it. Yeah. So what kind of issue, what's the most predominant issue that can come up for people that need help? Right now, our main request is people looking for therapy. Um, And there are also a a ton of submissions around anxiety and depression. We see a lot of requests for um, recovery support. So those dealing with substance abuse. Um, But really the number one thing we're hearing is that people want to find a therapist and that can be hard for a number of reasons. Um, It is tough to find a therapist that is affordable, um, which is becoming more and more apparent as our industry hasn't really been able to work over the past year. So more and more people need therapists that are willing to do sliding scale or pro bono sessions for them. Um, And we are super fortunate in that this network of clinicians that we've made around the country, many of them do offer sliding scale or pro bono rates for our clients. Um, So that is our number one need. And oftentimes we're hearing now, thank you so much for connecting me with this therapist. It's the first time that therapy has actually felt like it might work for me. Um, And again, that goes back to that we are personally vetting each and every one of our therapists and making sure that they understand what the lifestyle entails um, Mm -hmm. so that, you know, an artist is sitting down and they're being asked about what their next album cycle looks like. That kind of question can really promote a level of understanding and then the relationship can go deep much sooner than maybe it was before. Oh, because they can understand sort of the key factors that can incite a uh, level of anxiety with performers about like where they've got to be and that st- those sort of things can can those sort of things get exacerbated when you're on tour is that a particular thing that can be worse when you're just not at home all the time absolutely and there's a lot of um a lot of additional mental health challenges for creators as you know, bearing your soul and your music and your words and your art is an additional mental health challenge. You're kind of right. um, out there putting out your heart and soul to be consumed by others. Um, and I certainly rely on music to get me through a hard day. And many of our music creators, you know, are bringing hope to people all the time. Yeah. And so that can be a hard burden to, to weigh. So there are a ton of reasons why this industry is unique. Um, when we were touring, there's lack of sleep, lack of privacy. Um, the fact that your band operates in many ways like a second family. Um, you know, it's not always easy to tell your family members what's going on. So that same sentiment can apply yeah. to the people or, that you're traveling or, around <clears throat> with. Or bitch at them in a constructive manner. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so for a therapist to say, who is your support system at home and who's your support system on the road, them just understanding that you have two separate families is an important thing and an important distinction. Have you ever had a situation where multiple you do like a group therapy for the crew or group therapy for a band we have had um some people come to us looking for mediation um which Mm. is actually a very cool thing to hear about bands bringing in mediators or professional therapists to have a conversation around a new album or what going back on tour would look like 
Um, and so we do have some mediators in our network that we're able to refer out to, but we don't actually provide um, that kind of direct service. So w if, if I were an individual and I was having some issues, I could contact, I could call a number. What, what exactly do I do? Um, you, how do I? You go like to I, our website and fill out a form um, mm -hmm. under the tab, get help. And on that form, you say, you know, who you are and what you're looking for. All of that data goes confidentially into our software. Right. Um, but you immediately get back an email to schedule time with one of our case managers. All of our case managers are licensed clinicians. Um, and they get on that call with you and they ask questions like, do you have health insurance? Do you have an ability to pay for sessions? Um, have you ever tried therapy before? You know, do, does the um, race or gender or orientation of your therapist matter to you? And then we go out and provide them with a list of customized resources. So we'll say, you know, here are three therapists to reach out to. Here's a local organization that could help you get signed up for health insurance. Um, and here is a scholarship grant available from one of our partners that can help cover the costs of therapy. So really taking that assessment moment as an opportunity to really dive into the specifics of their unique situation so that the resources that we're providing to them are available and accessible to them specifically. Um, and that is a game changer as well. So our clients will then take that information and reach out to, you know, the organizations or therapists on their own. If for some reason they couldn't get in with any of those therapists, they can always come back to us and, you know, or say, I think I'm ready to try a different modality or do you have any wellness resources? Because I think starting a meditation practice could be helpful in addition to what I'm doing. And so our case managers exist to really be your super smart friend who understands the mental health care landscape and is willing to go to the ends of their ability to help you get the right kind of help and make sure that you feel great about the people that you're working with on your mental health journey and that you're not having trouble accessing care for any reason. Right. So um, the case managers, are they hired by Backline or do they, are they working pro bono for you? Both. Um, we do have a clinical director and a head of case management, both of whom are within the Backline staff. Um, all of our staff are on stipends, so it's not like we've got a full-blown operation, but um, we do have our quote, full-time staff, mm -hmm. and we, we all also have other jobs, um, but make the time to make this as much of a full-time gig as we can because the need is there. Um, and then we also have some volunteer case managers that are being onboarded by that clinical staff um, and managed by them, but are each offering a couple hours a week to take these calls and to help make sure that we can see more and more people. And is that type of relationship the same sort of uh, financial arrangement and economic arrangement that you have with the, the therapist that the case managers will refer to? Or is that kind of on a case-by-case so -case basis? That's all on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we don't pay out any therapists directly because we are really just give, giving them client referrals. So we tell the clients, you know, reach out to these three therapists and they are offering $50 rates for backline clients. Um, and then it's up to them to pay each other. You know, we see ourselves out at that point. And so by operating as a referral network, we are able to do the work that we do really well and leave some parts out of it so that we're not, you know, biting off more than we can chew. Wow. It's a grind of a lifestyle, right? I mean, that's kind of, those are the things that are, that are, that are coming out. And I, you know, I talk to a lot of people on this show and, uh, you know, most of the touring people that we talk to, you know, they'll, they'll talk about how hard touring is, the ways that they can manage it. And, and, um, you know, mental health is really right at the top of that. So, um, I think people are aware of uh, the issues and are aware that there's um, that there 
uh, is a danger to kind of fall, to go down into that rabbit hole for sure. Um, are you seeing that change? Is it worse than what you had seen before? Like what's kind of the, what's the path that we're, that we're on right now? We are in uncharted territory. Um, Backline was only six months old when COVID lockdowns began. And as you know, our industry was the first one to shut down and will likely be the last to go back to full operation. Um, and so last March, uh, when the lockdowns began, our numbers of submissions immediately quadrupled Wow! and they have stayed around there if not grown since then um and there are really a lot of people looking for support right now because you have a new level of financial insecurity you have a loss of identity for many people um a loss of community as well um for people who are used to getting to see their friends on tour um, we're also hearing things from, you know, touring professionals who have never really lived at home. Um, and there's a, an <laughs> Help, I want to go back out on that, tour. Help me. <laughs> yeah. And just being, you know, with your partner or your kids full time is a, is a real shift, um, and joyous in so many ways, but also challenging. Yeah. Um, I'm like, huh, no wonder I want to go out on tour so much, <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> not to make light of it, but you know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we have to make light of it because I think as individuals, we can all understand that day to day is hard. Sometimes it's great to be around your friends. Sometimes it's hard to be around your friends. And the yeah. same goes for your family or anyone else that you're on top of. Yeah. Um, so we are so glad that, you know, we had launched in advance of this pandemic and there was no way to tell that it was coming down the pipeline. But we are certainly uh, very glad and grateful to the universe that we were there to meet the need. And um, things continue to shift now day by day. And, you know, there is no clear answer on when touring starts back. Um, we are watching people decide not to be in the music industry right now. Um, and so we're understanding that who all is involved on the other side of this is going to look different. Um, and, and within backline, we are already starting to look at the resources that we can provide that will help people transition back to touring life. So yeah. what sorts of things can we provide that will help deescalate, um, panic attacks or anxiety, you know, backstage. So it's a long road ahead of us and, and it's been a long year, but um, we are seeing people reach out more and more for support and are very encouraged by the way that this community is choosing to use this period of time to learn new wellness modalities that can help them out when they get back out there. So it's been hard and, you know, encouraging at the same time. And yeah, I try to make sure that I look at the positive. Yeah. It's like, um, you got hit with this huge curveball, this whole fucked up curveball that everyone's been hit with, obviously. Um, and, uh, you had to sort of, it was, and I mean, if I can kind of look at it from the big picture, it's like, um, you were almost offered like a new opportunity to offer other types of, uh, services to those for different reasons that you had no idea <laughs> to expect when you first put this in place. And, um, and now you're, you're coming at, uh, there's all kinds of other needs because of COVID because of the show shutdowns that you could have never foreseen. Yeah. Um, one of the new resources that we launched as a result of the pandemic was support groups that meet on Zoom now three times a week. Mm. We are going on 50 weeks of support groups, and they have played such an important role in our story because they are free to attend for the music industry. And so in terms of us being able to provide no cost resources, that is such an amazing place and it is a safe place for music industry professionals to say things that they're not saying elsewhere. Like, you know, I know that 
there's so many other things going on in the world, but I don't know who I am without an audience. And to have a forum to talk about identity and who you are without shows or without live music is really critical in our community digesting their own mental health and place in the world. Um, so those have been really powerful and it wasn't something we were looking at launching before the pandemic that now I really can't imagine backline without these free support groups because they are really important to the, the community that we serve. Yeah, that you can do that for free is amazing. And I'm sure you get a lot more people signing up for these things. Like, no, the first thing that occurs to me is like, how do you organize uh, free groups? How many people sign up for this? And how many groups are there at any going at any one time? There are three groups a week. Uh -huh. um, each one meets in the early afternoon, depending on where you are um, right. on Zoom. But are there and like hundreds of people on the Zoom call? It's like some insane. There's usually about 15 to 20 people huh. per call. Um, we've had more attend at different points in time, but um, we have about 15 to 20 regular attendees on each call. Right. Um, and some of them have been together you know, our Monday groups was the first one that we launched. And so they've been together for the past 50 weeks wow. that, um, you know, and new people join in, but there's a whole community there that have really supported each other during this time. And they didn't know each other before this and now would very much tell you that they are a family. Um, and that is such a powerful testament to the work and conversations that are happening in there. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the first thing that occurred to me is like, this can be something that can extend even past when we go back to shows. Right. I mean, like so many other things we've been seeing the zoom technology and this long distance sort of connectivity that everyone's experiencing for a bad reason, but it actually is a positive. You can really take advantage of that. Right. Definitely. And we're excited to see, you know, where we take things when, when we do that because it's always changing on our end um the pandemic has forced us to pivot and to be really creative around how we are providing resources and i i like a bit of a challenge and it's certainly been the biggest one that has come across my desk so i'm really proud of the way that our team has responded to this ever increasing need um and very excited to see where backline heads in the next few years so have you seen an increase in individuals that are taking advantage of backline services during covid than any time prior well i guess that's kind of yeah. a loaded question and like statistically because you've been in operation during covid more than not <laughs> so but yes. but you know what's, We're what's definitely the trend seeing a we're definitely seeing a, a growth in people using our services. And again, statistically, that may just be because there are more touch points to backline now. You know, we have more partners talking about right. this. We've talked to more people in the music right. industry about it. Um, but one of the big ways that we are getting the word out there is that um, we join our partners and management companies for conversations with their staff around our resource and, and what is specifically available. And so we have been invited to go into record labels and, and different groups of people oh, and say, hey, Backline exists for you. And so to hear it from one human to another in this amazing virtual technology space um, is really making people feel more comfortable using the service. And so we're seeing a lot more people take advantage of it. And we are scaling up the amount of case managers that we have to, to continue to meet the need. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's exciting yeah. too, is, is just being able to see, you know, clinically how we're growing and, and that right. we're committed to scaling up. Yeah. So as you reach more into uh, the touring world, because you have case managers and therapists that are well versed in the music industry and live music industry in particular, you're able to branch out and go into the music industry at large. Is that that's kind of the direction? Yeah. Um, and from our onset, we have set out to serve the industry as a whole. Um, so we see everyone from artists to photographers. 
record label executives, agents, um, as well as anyone in the music industry's family member, recognizing that you are, if you are an artist or a manager and you, your wife is having a hard time or your sister's having a hard time, that's going to affect your mental health as well. And so right. we view it as an ecosystem and, and have pretty broad eligibility requirements around who can use our services because we want to make sure that anyone out there that is part of making the music happen and that includes partners and families and support systems that they have the resources that they need to be happy and, and healthy. Yeah. So we started out talking a lot about touring professionals, but it's, it's really kind of, was I going in too specific or is it like, is it just that it's the music industry? You're, you're, you're providing services for the music industry at large. At large, we are. I think we may have gone down the touring professional side of things just because when we built this, um, it was primarily a touring industry. Um, and so that is where most of the money lied at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of the bands that, that we know were having to tour to make ends meet. Um, and so now things have certainly shifted and people are figuring out lots of different ways and we may not see the touring industry come back in the same capacity that it did before. Um, but we do serve the industry as a whole and. I think we were just talking about how hard it can be for touring professionals to get help when they are, you know, in a different city every day. But it's also hard for music industries and in any music industry professionals in any capacity to get the resources that they need. Or anyone in anywhere to have some kind of like way that they can confidentially show up and tell somebody that they're having a hard time and they need some help. Absolutely. It's kind of a broader you're solving a broader issue in a, in a, in a, in, in a particular industry. Yes. And I think that more and more we're seeing um, other organizations pop up to serve industries because mental health journeys look different for everyone. Um, and so it's really hard to, you know, provide resources for people across the board. Right. If somebody had figured out how to do that, then we would not be having this conversation. Right. Um, but to have sort of niche industry specific organizations popping up that truly understand the lifestyle and truly understand the need that I think is where we're going to see real change happen. Well, are you saying that, I mean, there, there must be other industries where this type of model has been executed and is still in place, right? I mean, I'm making an assumption not there. Is this like a special industry for these kind of needs or, I, you know, I mean, or is it, it, it yeah, we so. are starting to see other industries reach out to us to learn more about our model. Um, for example, wanting to bring a similar organization to support restaurant and, and hospitality industry professionals, um, which is something, you know, we don't have the capacity to do that. Right. We've got hundreds of thousands of people in the music industry that we have to figure out how to serve, but happy like, to it's share your resources problem, people. on how <laughs> no i'm kidding <laughs> no i mean figure it out yourself opposite. just like, like i did show you... <laughs> no kind of the opposite like happy to show you the ropes yeah, yeah, if you yeah, can yeah, build a similar thing for and i don't understand you know how the restaurant industry works but yeah. i think the two are very similar in that there is no centralized leadership so, you know, the well, you're, you're, NFL you're, you're has also a, a forward facing to the public, which can be harsh. Totally. And kind of may, may or may not. I mean, you know, way more than I do, but it, I would sort of think it kind of brings along the same sort of some, some of the same mental stressors possibly. Are there other, possibly. are there any other, are there other industries that have approached you? Um, I have heard from the commercial fishing industry. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, lots of time away from home for them as well. Yeah. Interesting. God. I think of uh, the deadliest catch. So yeah, they could, they could use some, uh, some therapy. That's for sure. The way they treat each other. <laughs> um, let's talk about funding. Um, how are you doing in that area? What do you need? Uh, who are your major sponsors? Um, we are doing all right. 
Um, although that has shifted quite a bit as a result of the pandemic as well. Um, so one of the amazing things about Backline thus far is that we have really been supported by the music industry, um, and that means financially as well. So one of our biggest champions is uh, Billy Strings, amazing musician, dear friend of mine, and from the outset has been so supportive of Backline um, doing merchandise liquidation sales to benefit Backline, mm. doing streams and and a portion of tickets to support us yeah um, i just i just watched his stream and uh i donated to backline so there you go <laughs> there you go so we have seen a lot of that kind of support um and we're planning to see a lot more of that in 2020 we had several in bands signed on to do uh no last year oh you saw more um, of that in 20 uh-huh okay yeah we we were we were forecasting a very healthy budget um you know, due to bands saying we will give you a dollar per ticket on this upcoming tour, or wow. we're going to have a specific merch item that we're selling on this tour that will benefit you, um, as well as venues supporting in the same way. So every show that comes through in July of 2020 was supposed to have a surcharge to benefit backline. And so we had all of these different elements that were going to help us have a really healthy budget. Right. Um, and I think that that narrative was so powerful because it was people from within the community that we serve saying, this is important to us and we're going to look at our revenue streams and see what we can do to make sure that we are philanthropic and that we are giving back to our community. Um, so many of those things went away as a result of the pandemic. And so we really had to go back to a grassroots fundraising approach at that time and call out to music fans and say, you know, we are supporting your favorite musicians and all of the people who have a hand in making the music happen. Um, and we have seen amazing support from the fan community um, we have received several grants, which has been super helpful um, from friends like Positive Legacy and Rex Foundation, um, as well as recently got significant support from Sony Music Group, which is really exciting for us as they're a pretty big player. Yeah, and absolutely. It, their sign of approval is, is incredible for us at this stage in our life. Um, but we are, you know, really trying to make it work in the funding world and every donation helps. Um, right now it costs us about $37 to provide mental health support to one person. So that in is for a like life cycle for that person or how? Well, yep. Okay. On, a, um, on average, you've seen that that's what that's the case with each individual comes in costs 37. Okay. Yeah. So, that number is is important to us because you know i can't access mental health care for 37 dollars no. um <laughs> no that's a great number to you, throw out there obviously you know this like if you're trying to raise money it's like help one person in the industry throw in 30 bucks or you know yeah that's right. a good metric excellent metric yeah so we've been talking a lot about that and also just talking about, you know, how we've barely begun to scratch the surface of the needs in this community. And as we scale up um, our marketing efforts to make sure that everyone in the music industry has heard about us, we also have to scale up our clinical efforts to make sure that we are ready to meet that need. And so um, we are out there talking about backline, trying to find the right partners to support our efforts yeah. that want to scale with us, make sure that we're doing that in the right way and in a way that is thoughtful and inclusive and um, appropriate for what we're trying to do. Yeah. Is that a challenging aspect is to get case managers and therapists on board uh, doing either pro bono work or at, you know, sliding scale rates? Um, it's, we have a lot of therapists coming to us that are hearing about this and, and really supportive. Um, so we are constantly getting submissions from therapists. Although if you happen to be one or no one, 
please send them to our website. Do we I are see, always accepting more. Do I kind more. of have a therapist vibe to you or something? Or like, not that that's a bad thing. I was thing. more talking to our listeners oh, out there. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so therapists you know. out there, yeah, get get in touch. Are they generally music fans that like see ads for it? They go to a show or something like that and they're like, oh, I want to get involved and help. I want to, I, yep. want, I want to meet and, some of the performers. And also, no, uh, <laughs> no, that's kind of what our vetting process is trying to weed out. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> is, is that exactly. I'll thing, help you but, for a backstage pass. Yeah. That's exactly what you want to avoid. <laughs> right. Um, but we do have a lot of our industry connections and artist connections getting their therapists to sign up to help other people saying this is a therapist who really gets it. And I think they should be part of the backline network, um, which is fabulous. And um, a lot of people, yeah, we there were therapists watching the Billy Strings stream last week that heard about us and wanted to be a part of it. And so right. our team will be getting on the phone with them over the next few weeks to do that vetting call and make sure that everything is lined up and that we have an understanding of, you know, what their sliding scale rates are. And, um, yeah. we are always growing that network. I love that. I love how it's just snowballing and getting to more people in the way that it does in such an organic fashion and that individuals contact you from different branches of what you do. I mean, I think that's amazing. And like, uh, venue owners and promoters should have like an extra dollar. Like, uh, oh, do you want, you know, when you buy your ticket, do you want to donate to Backline also? I think so many people click a dollar, right? Yeah. So, so many of those things are in the works and we, you know, are ready to go back out and work with our industry partners to make sure that they're taken care of. So in the example of a venue, them having a dollar add-on, really benefits us and it benefits their staff too. You know, their staff to know that they're supported to know about this resource that they can get free support when they need it. And so in many ways, it's a collective pot for our community. So when an artist or a venue decides to support backline, that could actually be used by one of their crew members. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it all, it's, so so it's very, very self-perpetuating because I mean, Sony's in it. They're like a big, huge name and other huge names. They only have an interest in the mental health of the, the professionals that are the, the creative professionals and the crew that help support them either on the road or in the studio or whatever they're doing. It's like, it's about just the general health of the industry at large, just benefits all of the larger names and everyone else. Right. Yeah. It, it is uh, what, what I like to say is that a rising tide lifts all boats and that is really what we're I trying to do here. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> well, you do the marketing pitch all the time. So yeah. Rising tide. Uh, yeah. Rises. What is it again? Lifts all lifts, boats. lifts. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> it's not like I'm in the words business or anything. <laughs> lifts all boats. Okay. Um, wow, that's great. You do such great work, Hillary. And, um, um, I wish you so much luck with this and I, I just want to applaud you so much for taking care of, um, of the mental health of those in the music industry. Thanks. So, it really is a way for me to give back to something that has given me so much throughout the year. So in that way, it's a little self-fulfilling too. I want to make sure that the soundtrack of my life is continuing to grow and that new music is being created and that all of those people feel supported and in, in doing that. So it is truly an honor. That's fantastic personal mission and that it dovetails into your professional mission mission as well as awesome. So, uh, I'll be donating to Backline whenever I can, and I hope that uh, that a lot of people do, and I hope all those big corporations uh, heed the call because it's a, it's a phenomenal organization and you're doing great work. So thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing everything about Backline, and um, God, I just, I just wanted to help people. Me too. Thank you for being a part of spreading the word, and I will do our little bit of pitch here at the end. You can find more about us at www.backline.care um, or on social media at backline.care. There you go. www.backline.care. All right. Right. And on social media is the handles backline, just backline.care. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Okay. There you go. Thanks so much, Hillary, for being with me and talking with me. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Okay, that was Hillary Gleason of 
back line and um, gosh, she just does such amazing work and has this uh, such an impressive background in mental health and nonprofits and bringing nonprofits, uh, bringing businesses and music together that I find just so in interesting and her devotion to uh, larger global causes and to mental health causes and to nonprofits is really super inspiring to me, but I really applaud her work with Backline. I mean, I want to support the live music industry as much as I can, and I want those in the live music industry uh, to be able to have the resources to continue to be on the road in a healthy manner, to be able to look after their own mental health when necessary, and to know that those are problems that everybody has and that there are ways to help alleviate the stress and the mental stress and um, a lot of those problems that can accompany being on the road for such a long amount of time doing such amazing work to bring live music to everyone. And um, I'm so happy that that Hillary has found a niche to be able to to uh, provide uh, services and to do what she does. And I want to thank all her and I want to thank uh, the therapists that get involved and other me mental health professionals that get involved with the back line to to talk to those in the industries that need in the industry that need help when they are needed. And I want to urge everyone to continue to donate generously to Backline so that they can continue to provide the services they provide. And part of that would be to tune into their online stream on April 10th on the Relics channel at Twitch. Um, they're going to be announcing some very special musical guests uh, on their social platforms very shortly. And I know that it's going to be a great day. And I encourage all of you to support that stream and to, again, donate generously so they can continue to do the work that they do. And I want to thank Hillary again for being here on this special episode of Road Case so that we can learn more about what Backline does. So... Thanks to Hillary, and I want to thank all of you for tuning in to this very special episode of Road Case. Thanks again so much for listening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Road Case. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Road Case Pod. And we have a YouTube channel called Road Case Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Road Case, we have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Road Case. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road.